let's start. So, well, first of all, glad for you to, to be here. I hope you enjoy this talk. And uh, just interrupt me anytime uh, you have any question. Don't do tough questions, preferably. <laughs> so we're here to talk about um, one billion tables. A little bit of background first, who I am. I'm Alvaro Hernandez, or Alvaro, whatever it's, it's easier for you. I work at a company based in Madrid, Spain, called Gnosis, Networked Open Systems. And we basically do consultancy and training in areas such as PostgreSQL, of course, a little bit of Java, sorry to say that, and, uh, and also architecture and development on top of cloud computing like uh, Amazon AWS. We're Enterprise EV partners. We do a lot of training. And well, there you have the coordinates if you want to, to get in touch with me. So um, first, we need to answer a question. What is a large database? Because, well, usually, a large database is considered as something which can hold up to terabytes or even dozens of terabytes on a single node, um, with a number of records of billions to maybe trillions of records for the largest databases. If you go to multiple nodes, then the size is, is virtually unlimited. And then uh, there are cases, well-known cases, of databases up to hundreds of terabytes or even petabytes. So pretty large databases. But this talk is not about big databases. It's not about big data. Indeed, oh, by the way, there's something wrong with the presentation here. It's not showing all of it. So let's, let's try to change the screen resolution. Worse. I guess it's going to get worse. Hmm. Well, okay. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing. Well, let's keep going. Hope there's nothing really important to write that. <laughs> you know that will speak. So um, I was saying that this talk is not about data, about big data. It's just about big, but in a different way. Indeed, I should say that we're talking about big metadata. And we're probably going to be showing the worst data to metadata relationship ever. Well, it's zero, but anyway. <laughs> so what types of, of databases? Yes, here's the problem. We don't see the numbers there. Well, doesn't matter. So um, I've been researching the number of tables found in, in, in some databases. We have the what I call the schema-less like single table database, which some designers uh, try to exercise, which has one table. Well, so far, so good. I have also found uh, one customer of mine that had an extremely denormalized enterprise CRM with just, with just two tables. Those are hard exercise. Really, it's tough. I can promise you. Then we have small databases with, I don't know, around 20 tables, medium, around 80 tables, large, around 200. Then we have extra large what I call the ORMs going wild databases with, I don't know, thousands, 5,000 databases, uh, tables in the database. Multi-tenancy, uh, you can get a higher number if you're, multi uh, if you're doing multi-tenancy, around 50,000, let's say. Massive multi-tenancy, around 1 million uh, tables. And if you go to VTP, the billion tables project, we're talking about a billion tables in the database. 
So you can see the number of tables for these different databases in a logarithm scale, just, just for you to show up the, the difference. So uh, what are the limits of PostgreSQL we're talking about? There is a limit on the number of attributes on a given table, depending on the, ty on the type of the columns it may vary. There's a, a limit also on the size of the attribute. And as a consequence of, of both of them, the, the first two, there's a limit on the size of a row. There's no limit in the number of rows per table. There's a limit on the table size of around 30, well, of 32 terabytes. And the number of tables in a data in, in a symbol database. It's unlimited and also the maximum size of a database. We're going to be testing this. This is basically the purpose of the database. So the, the limitation for the OIDs, yeah. we're not hitting that. We're not there yet. It's just 1 billion. OK. So where it all started, I uh, didn't read this email before, but I found it. And basically, we cannot read it in full. It doesn't matter. So it was an, an email by, by uh, Simon Coley in, in the uh, admin mailing list guessing that the number of, maximum number of tables is unlimited. So um, he guessed that uh, realistically, it could get to trillions of tables. Well, I can tell you, no, you cannot get trillions, at least as of today. But let's see if we can get a little bit closer than that. And of course, the man sitting there, there was also responsible for this idea and published a blog post that inspired us to, to try to do this crazy thing of creating a billion tables in the database. So why do this? First of all, to prove that PostgreSQL has no limits on the number of tables. That's a statement, but nobody has proved that. So let's try to prove it. To stress PostgreSQL in an unusual way. PostgreSQL is stressed in many different ways. It's probably not in this dimension. And well, we had a spare server. I uh, wanted to test it before going to production. So let's, let's do it. Well, you cannot read it, but these are the official reasons. Let's look at. Sure, sure, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to stress the, the disk subsystem of the of the of the server. But this is, I was saying these are the official reasons. But in reality, first of all, we wanted to beat Josh Berkus, created creating tables faster than you. <laughs> That's the main driver behind this this talk. Of course, we want to say mine is bigger than yours, <laughs> the database. And finally, because we can, or so we thought. So we need to change the definition. What's the TPS? Well, from Wikipedia, it says that transactions per second refers to the number, well, you know, actions performed per second. From now on, it's going to be tables per second. <laughs> OK, first attempts. Back in 2011, Josh Berkus, again, tried uh, to get some, some tables created fast. He created, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was you said on your blog post that you were creating 3 million tables, around 83 tables per second. The server crashed because it ran out of disk space. And you were creating a table with a serial integer column and a, a text column. There was a second attempt <laughs> by John, hmm? creating 4.6 million tables before the server crashed because of running out of inodes at around 1K TPS. Pretty good. And uh, uh, he dropped the, the sequence uh, just using an integer call and a text call. Uh, after doing some math, uh, we, we um, we found that it's not possible. Uh, we need a lot of space to create these tables. We'll talk about that later. And so we dropped the text column. And uh, I did some initial attempts. And uh, I was able to do 10 million tables at 2K2 tables per second, stopping the, the run, and 100 million tables at around 1K5 tables per second. 
This is all, also posted as a comment on the post on, on Josh blog. So well, it was, it was OK. Um, we exercised a little bit all the system. But um, well, there were some problems. Oh, it's difficult to see this. Whatever. Well, the first problem is that we were running out of disk space. And to create all this metadata, you yeah, I know. <laughs> so um, we ran out of this space very soon. First of all, because tables are stored in PG class. Well, not the tables themselves, the, the, the structure of the table, the definition, uh, the name of the table. So, uh, well, we are inserting a billion rows in PG class. And that requires a storage. It was there, it's, there's a diagram there about the, the page structure. But, well, basically you'll know that there's uh, data items and each table is going to be used in one of them. So we needed a lot of storage there. But we also needed a lot of storage in the file system because its, it's table is going to be creating at least one file in the file system. And even though the file is empty, uh, there's a space required for the inodes, the name of the file. I mean, the file system metadata. And it's also large. So we need to find a large storage. So um, how to get to 100, uh, 100 million tables? We also need RAM. This is what happened on, on some test. We're running out of memory. And the out of memory uh, subsystem from the Linux kernel was killing the, the PSQL, uh, sorry, well, the, the, the script creating the tables. We also need a file system who handles well a large number of files. We found out that that well, was a good guess that Razer file system is the only one who's able to cope with such a, lar a large number of files in the file system. And we also need a good table creation strategy. The first test we were doing, we were, um, were uh, creating a, a CSV file or SQL file pre-populated -pre and, and fit it to PSQL. That wasn't working quite well. We didn't even think about using anything uh, with a driver over TCP IP, just using local connections. That was not going to work. Well, at least not fast enough. And so the final solution was to basically uh, launch a PSQL command and feed the create table statements via its standard input. So we create a program that writes the um, create statement statements and uh, dump them to the standard input of PSQL. That turned out to work quite well and, and quite fast. Of course, there's some work to do on, on PostgreSQL.conf. And of course, these are some settings not very recommended for all the uses rather than creating tables fast, like fsync off, Synchronous commit off, full page writers off. We need a little bit of RAM for wall buffers and auto vacuum. Yeah, auto vacuum. Talk about that later. Also, uh, depending on the number of tables you are, well, I'll show that later, but uh, we were restarting the PSQL processes once in a while after a number of tables created. created and depending on, on that number of statements we uh, sent to the PSQL command, uh, there was a different use of, of wall records and uh, logs per transaction. We need to increase that. If you have some RAM free, uh, we had on the next server, uh, increase also shared buffers and increase checkpoint segments. That def that's definitely necessary to a large number. So the f this first test uh, done in 2011, uh, we're done with, uh, well, Simple server, very easy to find, Intel Core 2 CPU with four gigabytes of RAM and three one terabyte disks. We specially bought for this. And uh, yeah, that's uh, approximately the storage requirements for doing this exercise. We're using the Razer file system and PostgreSQL 9.0. The script, it's gonna be hard to read from, the, from there, I guess. But it's more or less something like this. It was a Python script that basically uh, 
uh, decided uh, to do a number of iterations. For each iteration, it's, um, it's creating a number of SQL statements and restarting the PSQL process. And it's uh, spawning a new uh, PSQL uh, process, PSQL command, for uh, issuing the create table statements, doing a change point afterwards, and then logging uh, a lot of information about disk usage, duration, uh, memory, memory stats, and, and see uh, how long does it take. It's basically a very basic script. I'm very proud of it, but it worked quite well. And so this is our more or less the results. Uh, in red, it's the TPS, remember, tables per second. And in blue, uh, it's the time in seconds. So to reach one mil 100 million tables, we needed around uh, 1,000, sorry, the time is in, in minutes. So we needed around 1,000 1, minutes. And the tables per second started uh, well, around uh, 2.5k, but the speed was was uh, going down, and if we continue this trend, it will end up around 600 tables per second or something after three or four hundred million tables. So this is not going to work to reach the billion tables unless you want to wait for a month. And as as I was saying, this usage is, is quite high. So we need 10 times this, 2.6 ter. 2.6 terabytes. Apart from that, we found some other problems. Auto vacuum. But wasn't it turned off? Yeah, it's off. But no, it's a problem. And the reason is that auto vacuum is also kicking in independently of the setting. When? When it reaches auto vacuum freeze max H. Correct me, correct me if I am wrong, but I think this parameter was not in 9.0, got in 9.1 or 0.2 or something. Really? Oh, OK. Well, by default, it's set to 1 billion. So it's quite risky to try to create 1 billion tables with, with this setting to 1 billion. So we have to raise it, because we saw auto vacuum kicking in. Hmm? Yeah. OK, OK, OK. So th then th that was the reason. Thank you. So yeah, it was kicking in, the auto vacuum, and it basically made the, the whole process to stop. Because it's going to scan 200, 300 million tables. Not fun. Not fun at all. So this was uh, a really bad enemy to fight, but easily uh, fi uh, easy to chase and, and to fix. We'll, we'll see how many transactions we're creating. Because uh, remember that we're feeding the, the commands over P a standard input, and there's no transaction. We, we tried that yeah. to create in batches of transactions, but the performance was quite worse. Really? Yeah. And the use of, of wall was skyrocketing. I tried creating batches of 10K and 100K, something like that. Maybe with more transactions would work. But so far, I found that the best performance was not using transactions at all, which seems contrary to the common belief, but it was that way. We're doing something uh, different. And the other enemy, it's not very related to PostgreSQL, but kicked in also and completely ruined another test after, I don't know, four or five days. Update DB. Yeah. Who the hell enables that by default? <laughs> the update DB? Well, the M locate. Uh, yeah, the file system database. This is, you know, scanning 200 million files, writing them on a, on a file based database. Not funny at all. So, what else do we need to, to, to reach the 1 billion? Storage. Critical points here. First of all, separate base uh, from the tables here. This is very important because uh, the files created, let's say, in, in a table space, and the files for the catalog uh, follow a completely different profile here. 
There's one creating small files uh, with a, a large number of files, while the other is just appending a lot of information to a table. So it's good to split them and set, and set separating conditions on them. So we created the table space, or more. We will see later that we created more. Uh, in a Razer file system, it's a partition that we name it uh, data. And for best performance was achieved using uh, uh, having the base uh, partition, the base files on an XFS file system, which we call big data, because it's where the, all the PG class stuff is going on. And finally, we put the wall records on RAM. <laughs> Who cares? The database is not, not durable already. So, well, if the server doesn't crash during the table creation process, it's OK. And we call that X log. What else? We need a larger pizza. The first server was not enough. And we wanted to go fast. Fortunately, we could afford it. So we brought in a. Um, Good CPU with 16 cores, 48 gigabytes of RAM, modern operating system uh, using Debian, Linux, and PostgreSQL 9.2.4. Fast machine, just takes six seconds to compile PostgreSQL source code. Pretty cool. No SSL. And we set up a nice storage subsystem. Basically, uh, data, the uh, Razer file system partition, was running a local storage with a 100 gigabyte cache memory controller uh, for the disk, uh, running RAID 10. The X log, we set up 90 gigabytes. Uh, during some tests, we used up to half of it, uh, using the, the maximum available amount of uh, RAM and also using a swap file system as a, well, swap as a, as a backup just in case the X log. Uh, built in because we had a lot of server crashes because of that. And the big data partition uh, was on a at over Ethernet server uh, using a 10 gigabit Ethernet channel, so pretty fast network for the storage, with around 6 terabyte on, with disks on, on RAID 0, software RAID 0. A pretty cool setup for, this, for the storage. Then the Table spaces. Except for Razer file system, every other file system suffered a lot with a large number of files. Even Razer degrades after several millions of files. So the only obvious reason, reasonable way, and I think it's not tricking the, the original statement of creating one billion tables, because after all, they are in the same database. So uh, we were uh, creating uh, table spaces. Uh, even though they are in the same partition with using the same Razer file system. And um, for the 1 billion run, uh, we well chose a number, it's, it's OK, which is one, uh, 1,000 table spaces. So each table space will be holding just 1 million files, just 1 million files. So it it's, uh, performs quite pretty well. We also designed our script to more or less be rotating uh, uh, during the uh, table spaces. So that very likely, no process will be hitting the same table space at the same time. That's not warranty, but it kind of works. What else? Concurrency. It is, of course, not feasible, well, unless you want to wait for a long time to use a single process. So we need to go concurrent. We went to this conclusion because table creation is not this limited. Indeed, if, if we look at the average disk throughput, we're doing less than five megabytes per second on the 100 million table test. So desk is not a problem. Well, storage is, but not disk spit. So who's limiting us? Well, our guess is that we have two limits. First one is the CPU speed. When we're running this on a single process, the, the CPU is running at 100% speed. So it's creating tables as fast as the CPU can, processing the statements and, and, and everything. Uh, we couldn't create prepared statements because the statements are dynamic, and, and so we need sparsing. Um, and, well, that's it, not preparing. But uh, we couldn't do that, so CPU is, is intensive. Uh, faster CPUs were doing more tables per second. But especially, there's, there's some contention. When we use more processes, we can create tables faster, but CPU usage drops a little bit. We'll, we'll see that later. 
But anyway, the, the way to get faster, if we cannot get a faster CPU, is to use more cores, more CPUs, and, and do more tasking in parallel. So we launched uh, several processes in background, and the sweet spot seemed to be a 16 process, which is not surprising, because this machine had 16 true cores. We also tested with 32, and it was uh, performance was slower. It was working, performance was slower. Which means that CPUs are used more or less quite well by PostgreSQL. Well, now we have another problem, which is in the first uh, exercise we're doing, each process was logging uh, the number of tables created and some information about disk storage and the free memory and everything. But if we run several processes, well, things get tougher. Because we cannot have every process to log independently. How are we going to merge and consolidate all that information? So um, basically, we chose to run another process to log the data. So in order to make this work, the logger process has uh, receives this argument, the PID of every uh, worker process. And when the logger wants to log the data, it basically sends a USR1 signal to the worker processes, which are listening to. And these worker processes, uh, sorry, and, uh, and the logger, after sending the signal, is going to start reading from a, from a FIFO, from a FIFO from the file system, named after the PID of the worker process, where the worker process is going to print the number of tables, plus some information about the state, uh, if its current state, basically whether it finished or not. So this is the way we can log the data uh, on a consolidated uh, fashion. So how is the source code? Well, the worker is a Python script derived from the original one that I saw earlier. It divides the number of tables assigned to the worker in iterations. For each iteration, it spawns a new uh, PSQL process and starts feeding the create table table space. Uh, statements via standard input. When it uh, it traps the the SIG USR1 signal and writes the number of tables to the FIFO, and when it sent the SIG term signal, it exits. Doesn't exit when the task ends because the logger process may still want to read the uh, the table information, the log information. So it's going to be the the logger process who who um, sends the signal to terminate to the worker processes. And well, the, the iterations, the spawning on the, of the PSQL processes, they also run on their own thread. We launch another thread there because the uh, uh, signals, uh, want, we wanted the signals to run on the main thread, thread not to interrupt the I.O. of the process, of the Python process. Then the logger. The logger is a cell script that basically, when, when uh, receives an, an USR1 signal, it starts logging, sending the signals to the other worker processes. And, the, and there's a third script, the main, which is another cell script, which basically launches, er, launches everyone, both the worker processes and the, and the, launch, and the logger process, and uh, cycles to uh, send signals to the logger process for, for it to log the data. Basically, every 10 seconds we're, we're logging. I think it's not, we're not going to be able to see this. You'll have to look at the posted slides. But this is basically a diagram of everything I have been explaining, how the uh, BTP main process is la launching the worker processes and the, and the logger. And uh, the worker processes are process trapping the signals and writing to the FIFO the information about the number of tables and the logger collecting that information and logging into the file, whatever. I'm so sorry. You cannot, I guess you cannot say it quite well. How the code looks like, well, I think I'm going to skip this. But this is more or less the Python code of the, uh, sorry, the cell code of the main process, which basically, I can show it in the cell maybe. It's going to be easier to be seen here. Let's try.
better? Yeah, okay. So, well, I don't want to get into the details of the, of the process, but the main, just, just to show the main idea here is that, uh, first of all, uh, we iterate over the number of processes. We launch here the worker processes with all the parameters that they need to run, like the table offset where they start, the identification, number of tables per process they do, and uh, the number of table spaces. We gather the, the PID, and then we launch the logger process with all the process IDs of all the worker processes. And finally, we loop, uh, logging every 10 seconds, sending a USR, USR1 signal to the logger process for, for it to log. This is basically the, the main idea. The worker processes or work more or less like this. <clears throat> well, they, tra they trap the, the signal, basically open the FIFO and write to the FIFO both the if they're finished and the created number, number of tables so far. By the way, if, if we look at the data, uh, it's not, um, we're doing asynchronously the creation of tables because we're writing to the standard input the number of uh, the create stable statements and then uh, PSQL is, uh, and Postgres are processing as fast as they can. But if we try to report the created number of tables, the, our program will probably be uh, reporting that number in multiples of the number of tables per process because the program is, is faster than PSQL sending the statement commands rather than processing them. But it's okay. Um, and basically this is the, the iteration where we just uh, issue the create uh, table statements table space. We also made the, uh, the name of the tables as, as minimum as, minimal as possible. And well, we launched the iterations in an in independent thread, not to be the, the process of creating tables, the I.O. interrupted by the signals. And well, basically, uh, if, if uh, whenever we're done, when we receive the, the term signal, we remove the FIFO and annex it. So this is basically the, the worker. And finally, the, the logger process looks something like this. This is where it um, sends the signal to the, to the process when, when, when we need to, to aggregate the count of tables, sends the signal to the worker process, read on the, read on the FIFO, exit if necessary, and increment the number of tables. This is just something for the more geeky programmers. If you want to know what's doing that, make a guess on Y42. Uh, what else? This is just some code for logging information. Nothing really interesting. And basically, this is a, the main loop. Uh, we detect when we are finished looking at this, uh, this set in memory about the number of workers that have already finished. And uh, we uh, just uh, iterate here, and when we're done, we just uh, kill, the, kill the workers. So this is basically the, the, a tour on the, on the source code using to, to do the tests. So the big, big question, did it work? I'm sorry to say that most of the tests that we have been doing have failed and that uh, we've been doing tests like around a month or more than that. And the last, last taste test we did was started on Tuesday or Wednesday this week, and it failed. But fortunately, we found the last one with some few parameters that worked. So we made it. That's one billion tables. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And it was quite fast. 33 hours. Sorry? <laughs> okay, okay. We'll do that. We'll do that. <laughs> Let's see. I'm, I'm going to show you some more information about this database. Well, the average number of TPS was around 8K average. So it's pretty good. 8K tables per second. It's so funny. 
to see the logs growing and growing, creating millions of tables in minutes. And uh, well, we look at the transaction counter. It was a little bit over at a billion, which makes sense. What else? Let's see how many entries are there on PG class. The expected number was 1,288,000,000, and it took a little bit more than two hours to make this query. <laughs> but it worked. This is the file system usage. The base directory used 2.6 terabytes, so PG class, 2.6 terabytes of very useful meta information. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry. And uh, depends. You're going to see depends. Amazing depends. Um, the uh, wall files were already, uh, they hit the top on around six, uh, six gigabytes. And the racer file system with a lot of empty files used 97 gigabytes. Again, useful meta information. Here we just grabbed some statistics about uh, the I.O. operations. And here we can see that Depend was using a lot of, of, of uh, I.O. Uh, work in the database. I don't know exactly why, but uh, it's, it's quite fun. And of course, we tried to use the database. And it worked quite well. I don't know. <laughs> I wish someone could have an answer for this. That was, this was quite a strange for me. Yeah. Hmm? But as I was saying, it's very fast to insert or to select from a given table. Yeah. 20 milliseconds inserts and 0.2 milliseconds query. So no problem at all. Very good. Congrats for PostgreSQL. I wouldn't expect this. And the big, 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 big question. How long does that DT take? Right, basically. <laughs> this is the approximation. The whole, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. I waited for 3,000 minutes and say, OK, let's cancel it. Right, of course not. If we look at the auto vacuum, which was kicking in and, and suffering so much, traversing all the tables, Something like DT could take a long, long time. And it, and it was, of course, just directing the output to a, to a file just to avoid um, using a lot of memory. But. <laughs> we could try. We could try. Well, if we look at the performance of this running test for creating the billion tables, it was pretty good. The, the table creation speed, the TPS, was dropping just very slightly. It topped at 10k per second and just uh, moved around a little bit over uh, 8k. The memory usage, it's not very easy to see, but basically all, all the, the, green, the green line is cache, and the, the red one and blue ones are buffers and mem free. What I was talking about earlier about the concurrency is that with 16 processes, the average CPU, CPU load of the system is 11.7. And the average load for the aggregated backend processes aggregated all across the test is 57%. But it's still quite good, in my opinion. Because there's, there's some, um, as I was saying, they're uh, contending, uh, they're, I mean, there are logs, there are um, non-concurrent regions in the whole process. 
and it's still doing a great job, in my opinion. So it's pretty good, pretty good results, I guess. Yeah. But comparing how uh, uh, food banks, for example, that voted on top of this, FEMA, Global FEMA, would perform. Yeah. Compared so, to an empty database. I mean, running that, uh, PG Bench on top of this database. Yes. Yeah. yeah. On that <laughs> How that affects the performance of, of the future. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, we'll try to do that. How long does it take to drop a code in <laughs> Don't even try. <laughs> no, you're running the <laughs> running the test. I had sometimes to to uh, do a drop database, so just drop table, drop database. Yeah, I, I usually kill it and it just run in its ID again. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, basically the, the, the way to restart the test was, was not doing, uh, as I was saying, a drop DB, but just anything the cluster again. It was not the way around. I'm dropping cache and everything. How about the PDF? Never try it. Don't want to try it. <laughs> it's going to be even worse, way worse than DT. So no, I'm never going to finish. Finally. Finally, once we have created this fantastic database with this fantastic data, we don't want to lose it. So let's make the database durable again. So I'll stop the server, move pglog to disk. It was in RAM, remember? Tune postgresql.conf, fsync on, synchronous commit on, full pages write on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't turn on out of cube. Don't even dare. I'm sorry about that. Do a manual vacuum on whatever tables you're using. I guess they're not going to be 1 billion tables. So do it manually. And restart your server. And enjoy that database. So some acknowledgments finished to you. Well, just Vercus and, and Selena and Jan, who happen to be responsible for this. And Alvaro Herrera. Oh, OK. Good to know. I'll fix that on the slides. Thank you. So for, for this, this idea, it was quite inspiring for us. Also, big, big, big thanks to Jose Luis Tallon, who worked with me. And bring, uh, he brought the server. Uh, we were on, and he configured the server and the storage subsystem. And he has been co-authoring co-working, co-architecting, co-programming, and definitely co-enjoying this. <laughs> and of course, to the PGCon organization and the sponsors. And one final thing. Then, I did register. <laughs> then, I did register. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. So that's it. Thank you. Anyway, but they were running out of memory 
uh, when doing exactly what? Because I haven't. Yeah. But then only if the query is touching a lot of tables. <coughs> oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I have heard of some some stories about uh, databases approaching the million tables, usually in, in multi-tenancy environments, and, and well, it's. There, are, there may be some work involved to make things like DT, well, I don't say PG admin, but at least some, some procedures to work better with the large number of tables. I think it's, it's an interesting field. <laughs> yeah. It's because you mean that the storing information uh, within the directory table. Yeah. And, and I guess that's also a huge save in space, disk space. But if you look at the average, there, it's not that much I.O. required. I, I know that performance in, yeah, in those sure. volumes <laughs> greatly varies. Even a reliable 10 megabyte spec like this is actually a lot more than that. Yeah, yeah, I know. There is a good option. I was looking, uh, just in case this, the server was not enough, I was looking at some options in AWS. And there's a, a two machines that fit quite well to for this scenario. One is there's, there's one machine who has it has uh, 24 disks of two terabytes each. So you can run, uh, not even write zero, but just setting up table spaces, each table space in different disks. And you're going to get a, a lot, a lot of, of I.O. Uh, local, local storage. Uh, it's the most expensive machine they have. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but I'll do to the test I mean, with just one million tables <laughs> or ten. No.
Then, oh, when you're done. Yeah, haven't tried. It, it already took quite some time to do this. So. Well. <laughs> okay, that's a different discussion. I know what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what happens. And they start competing with each other. Well, just just look anyway at the I, I can tell for PG Bench. I haven't tried it, but uh, remember the insert and, and selection time on on the table in this billing tables database. It was going fast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. There was one question back there? No? Okay. But you can also run an analyze on, on a single table. So uh, and, uh, our, our solution now, uh, reducing table, uh, numbers of tables is for each database. But uh, 
have you bought uh, some digital ideas uh, to make it uh, analyze uh, performance? But how are you running analyze? Are you manually doing the analyze, or are you just letting AutoVacuum do the analyze for you? First, we run uh, analyze by AutoVacuum, but yeah. it's not uh, open source, right? Yeah, so we are now uh, run by our hand or team. But uh, if here. I guess that if you're running analyze manually on, on tables, on selected tables at selected interval time, I guess then the, then the number of tables is not really going to affect your performance rather than the analyze process itself. So maybe if that's the case, it would be even better to have more tables, but doing partitioning on the tables. And the analyze times in those partitions would be probably faster. It's just a guess. But we are as soon as possible, we can, uh, we need uh, can uh, do that, of course. Well, yeah, but um, 10,000 tables is not a big deal. We can tell you, it's not a big deal. <laughs> so I guess not the number of tables is going to be the problem there, rather than the, the analyze itself. It has to, sc to scan the table. And if you need to do that, uh, maybe you could, as I was saying, partition the table. If it's, yeah. Well, if it's collecting all the names of the tables in memory at once. about um, horizontal partitioning? Um, I mean, horizontal partitioning, going to a different database. Because if it's a multi-tenant application already? I mean, if you want to assign different resources to different databases or different schemas within, within databases, there are two choices for you to do. Like, well, you could use different table spaces with different performance disk. Um, you can limit the uh, variables uh, memory, like work name for queries. Uh, there are a couple of things you can do. But uh, if you really want to separate resources, you're going to need different clusters. And, and being a multi-tenant environment shouldn't be that hard to scale uh, using different databases, different clusters. Mm -hmm. You mean moving moving the data? Yeah. 
Well, yeah, that's a great tool to have. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But yeah, sounds very nice. But I guess there's, I don't know it. I don't know if there's any, any tool like that. Yeah, maybe a big player using Postgres build has or something like that. But we don't, as far as I know. Okay, I need, we need to uh, wrap up or finish our in time. Well, supposedly, I mean, already been for one hour. So, well, thank you very much. I'll be uploading the slides and also posting source code to a repository. Thank you.